partnership with the University of Maryland School of Public Health and Sisters Together and Reaching. A recording of this program will be posted on the university's homepage. We'll provide that address in the chat area. And if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A section and we'll do our best to answer them. We have two moderators for the discussion today. Stephen B. Thomas, who is a professor of health and policy management at the University of Maryland College Park. He's also director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity. And now I will pass the mic to our other moderator, Reverend Deborah Hickman, who is the co-founder of Sisters Together and Reaching, a faith-based nonprofit organization that provides spiritual support and direct services and prevention education to HIV, AIDS infected, affected, and at-risk communities in a holistic woman and man-centered environment. Deborah. Thank you very much, Karen, for the introduction. I'd like to introduce Dean Reese at this time, who has been very engaged and gracious through the process of granting space for vaccine studies. Dean Reese is the Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs, University of Maryland, Baltimore. And he is also the John Z. and Akiko K. Bowers Distinguished Professor. He is the Dean of the School of Medicine. He also is a professor in the departments of obstetrics and gynecology, medicine and biochemistry and molecular biology. He is a member of the prestigious National Academy of Medicine. Without further ado, I turn the mic over to Dean Reese. Reverend Hickman, thank you very much. And welcome to everyone. It's a pleasure to, to join this, uh, this august group for this critical conversation that we will have. As many of you know, COVID-19 made a faster and deeper impact on our lives than any one of us could have imagined. We've all experienced some degree of loss over the past several months since COVID-19 has entered our environment. Therefore, I'm extremely grateful that we are having this very important conversation this afternoon. We're grateful to many individuals agencies and leaders who together have made a huge difference in the effect of our pandemic uh, process. Researchers at the National Institutes of Health, including Dr. Tony Fauci, as well as Dr. Kizzy Corbett and many others deserve great credit for what they have done in guiding us thus far. We also wanna thank in part the University of Maryland School of Medicine's Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health and its many partners across the country. Together, they have worked in a very collaborative manner to have produced multiple safe and effective vaccines. Thus far, over 15 million Americans have been vaccinated. Now, when COVID-19 invaded our lives in 2020, our only choice at the time was how we responded. For the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the School of Medicine, that took the shape of devoting our investigators' time and talent to bringing vaccine to fruition. It also took the shape of consciousness and carefulness to ensure diverse populations were included in the trials. Now the rest of us, we have a choice to make. The choice is simple, whether we accept that hard earned resource vaccine or not. Let me be very candid and very open. My choice and my decision was to accept that vaccination and to accept the hard earned uh, resource. I look forward this afternoon to a very robust discussion on that topic. It to me is an honor this afternoon to be a part of this uh, group, this uh, body, and to have this most important conversation. I'm delighted to welcome and to honor a good friend and colleague, Dr. Tony Fauci, who will be with us this afternoon to make uh, important comments. Dr. Fauci is known to everyone as America's leading scientist and in infectious diseases and vaccinology. Thanks to everyone for coming together and I look forward to a very important dialogue and discussion among each one of us. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Reese. As many of us know, we live in a country that has been shaped by systemic racism. And due to these systems and structures, black and brown Americans have had less access to healthcare. Neighborhoods have not been equally invested in, and thus there is a lack of quality resources which are key to healthy communities. It is imperative that we acknowledge that today's conversation is critical because of these historical facts, some of which have been truly traumatic to Black people. The systems and structures have not always leaned in our favor, but as poet laureate Amanda Gorman said this past Wednesday, scripture tells us to envision what everyone should, that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. Today, we are going to try to untangle these issues through an authentic conversation with scientists and the faith leaders who know our communities well. Being a leader for the past 30 years of a community-based organization founded at the height of the HIV epidemic, I understand the complexities of this moment in COVID and I value this moment of making space for this critical conversation. So I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who since 1984 has been the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease within the National Institutes of Health. And as of Wednesday, he is now the Chief Pandemic Medical Advisor to President Joe Biden. I have called him a trusted partner throughout the HIV AIDS epidemic, and no less, he is a trusted partner in the midst of COVID. I have no other honor at this time than to introduce the founder to introduce and welcome Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Reverend Hickman. And thank you all friends and colleagues. Al, it's good to see you. Thank you, Dr. Kotloff for your very fine introductions. So I wanna just make a couple of comments um, and they will be things you already know, but I think it's important to put it into, into context so that we can have a, a robust discussion uh, and I'll be relatively brief. Uh, as you probably know from hearing things that I have said over the past year, I think it's extraordinarily important uh, to engage in the community, uh, even if the community were not disproportionately affected by COVID-19. I mean, even in trueness to the uh, uh, the obligation, I believe, of equity when it comes to health, that even if everybody was equally at risk and equally had uh, com uh, uh, complications of the disease, it would be our moral responsibility to make sure that there's equity when it comes to health. But we have maybe an even more powerful reason for doing that, is that if you look at the numbers ranging from the chance of a brown or black person getting infected on the basis of a number of factors, probably the most important of which is the jobs that are have, the, the things that put you in the street, in the community, in essential jobs that are not jobs generally that have the protection of a computer screen or having the protection of being away from the, the, the big risk of infection, you have a higher degree or a higher incidence of getting infected. Once you do get infected, you have a much higher incidence of getting the, the severe outcomes of disease measured in hospitalization, intensive care, and death. And that relates very much, very much to the comorbidities that through no fault of your own, are related to the social determinants of health that you've experienced from birth, essentially. The fact that you have diseases that because of everything from lack of access to health care to dietary issues have put you at risk. Diabetes, obesity, hypertension, chronic renal disease, 
chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease. So if there's any demographic group that absolutely needs to benefit from what we have in the medical establishment, namely highly effective vaccines that are clearly safe, then brown and black people need to be have access to that. Now, the thing we face is the understandable, and I think that's the thing that the non-brown black people in the community need to realize whenever they hear that there's hesitancy on the part of brown and black people because of historical issues that can't go away. They're not gonna happen again, but the memory cannot go away. And that is the history of how the federal government over decades going back to Tuskegee and even beyond Tuskegee have treated brown and black people. So rather than get upset at brown and black people because they raise questions and have hesitancy, you have to say, we respect your hesitancy and we respect the fact that you have some doubt about what's gonna be going on with vaccines. Are they safe? Are they effective? Rather than get upset with that, we accept it and say, okay, one of the things that are important is that although those things did happen, there are safeguards in place now that they won't happen again. So wouldn't it be a tragedy if you deprived yourself of life-saving interventions because of an understandable reflex hesitancy, rather than saying, let's put that aside for a moment and look forward and say, what do we need to do to answer the questions of why apart from the concern about the Tuskegee phenomenon, what is it that makes you hesitant now? Do you think that things are going too fast? We can explain that because the speed, as you know, is related not to recklessness, but to the advances, spectacular scientific advances in platform technology. What about the safety and efficacy? Is it safe and is it, is it effective? Should I believe the government? Heck, they lied to us so many times, why should we believe them now? Is it the pharmaceutical company that wants to just make money on us? Well, it's neither because the safety and efficacy determinations have been made by independent bodies like the Data and Safety Monitoring Board that really are beholden to no one other than you, namely the general public. They're not beholden to the government. They're not beholden to the pharmaceutical company. They analyze the data and decide if it's safe and effective. When it is, and the company presents the data to the FDA, the career scientists are the ones that actually decide. And they do it in association with another independent group. So the process is both independent and transparent. Those are the facts that we got to, to establish before we even have a conversation. Now, accepting that, what do we need to do to get brown and black people to benefit the most from the scientific advances that are available? There are two things. One, you wanna get involved in the clinical trial process because when you do a trial like we did with Moderna and like we did with Pfizer, when the trial is complete and you get good efficacy and safety data, you'd like to be able to say that it applies to everyone. You don't wanna be able to have the open question, well, wait a minute, this looks like a great vaccine, but is it great for brown and black people? I don't know, because there weren't any brown and black people in the clinical trial. So you have to balance the putting aside the skepticism you have about getting into a trial to say, I want to be represented in a trial because I want the data to apply to me, to my family, and to my community. And that's the reason why we try so hard to reach out to black and brown people to get them to get involved in the trial. So they're part of the data. So we're gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes, I'm sure with a bunch of questions, but there's something that also extends from that. And that is apart from the trial, 
why we should get as many brown and black people in the community to get vaccinated once we have an established vaccine that's safe and that's effective. And in fact, we do have that. So we have two opportunities. We have the opportunity to get involved in a clinical trial to prove that it's safe and effective in brown and black people. And we have the opportunity to, for ourselves and our colleagues, our friends and our family, to make sure we get vaccinated when a vaccine becomes available. Let me stop there. I'm sure we have a lot of good questions. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Fauci. I will kick us off with this conversation and the five illustrious influential faith leaders will follow. And my first question is, why is it important to test more vaccines when there are two vaccines already available under emergency use authorization? Well, there are, that's a great question. Reverend Hickman, and there are some really good reasons for that. One, we need more vaccines because the companies that are involved by themselves are never going to be able to fulfill the obligation of all of the vaccine doses that are needed. That's the first thing. The second thing, each vaccine has different um, characteristics. One second. For example, the vaccines that we have now, as good as they are, they have stringent uh, cold chain requirements, number one. <clears throat> number two, they are, you know, comparatively speaking, expensive. Uh, not for you, it should be free, but it's for the, for, for, for the federal government to buy. It requires two doses. Others require one dose. For example, the Janssen one, which is fully enrolled, so it's, it, it's not gonna be applicable to you except when it gets an emergency use authorization and when it becomes available for you to take it if you want. It's, it's a big advantage to have one dose. Then there's Novavax, which is a product that is not a vector-borne one, that's a soluble protein, of which we have a lot of experience with in men, women, in children, in pregnant women. So when you think about vaccines, it's not going to be one size fits all. <clears throat> if you want one which is that we have the most experience with, the soluble protein of Novavax, even though we haven't proven for COVID, that it's safe and effective. I hope it will, I think it will. That platform, we have much more experience with than we do with the messenger RNA. So what we really want is we want three or four separate platforms so that people can have a choice. Some might be better for younger people, some might be better for older people, some might be better in geographic situations that don't have the capability of having cold chain capabilities. So there's many, many reasons why, even though we have two good vaccines, we want to keep testing them. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Fauci, for the answer to that question. And I am now going to turn it over to our first distinguished influencer, Bishop Walter Scott Thomas. Unmute. You need to unmute yourself. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hickman. Dr. Fauci, we all appreciate your contribution. Um, you have guided us through some of the most difficult time that we've had. So let me ask this question, Dr. Fauci. The African-American community does not really fit into the predominant model for vaccine delivery. Um, there are persons who have no access to internet, who have limited to no public transportation system access, who have health challenges that limit their mobility, who have major health challenges and who may not even affiliate with employment-based delivery and who live in areas where health disparities are well-documented. It's almost as if they're in certain rural areas where delivery systems are hard to reach them. Will the federal government help to coordinate vaccine delivery? And number two, 
Will there be resources for delivery systems that address the needs of these communities, of our communities? That is really a terrific question because it has really hit the nail right on the head on one of the things that we discussed right from the beginning in the planning of President Biden's plan of how we can efficiently and effectively get vaccines distributed in an equitable way. And every point you brought out, we'll refer to them as like pharmacy deserts or center deserts where it's difficult to access. So let me tell you what has in the plan. You're absolutely right. The federal government is going to get very heavily involved in collaboration with the local authorities to make sure we don't have these gaps. Because quite frankly, as much as the states do things well, you know from experience that goes well beyond COVID, when you tell the locals to do something, if it's not convenient, they may not do it. So you need federal involvement. So what is going to happen is there's going to be community vaccine centers that are going to be opened up, including in areas that serve minority communities. There is going to be mobile units that will go out into those hard to reach areas where people don't have their own form of either public transportation or don't even own an automobile to be able to get them to where they need to go. That is part of a very comprehensive plan that President Biden and the team has put together. So we were discussing this literally yesterday in the, in the White House, right before the press conference, when I sat down with President Biden and Vice President Harris to talk about just the things that you were mentioning. And it was really interesting because President Biden really harped on that. <laughs> he said, hey, wait a minute, I want to make sure we have enough um, capabilities to get out into those communities where people can't just go around the corner in the middle of a city and walk into a CVS or a Walgreens and pick up their vaccine. So that's the plan. You know, I can't guarantee it's going to work on the first day, but I can tell you the intention to get that to work well is very strongly embedded in the plan of the president. Thank you very much again, Dr. Fauci. I am going to ask that the clergy just step right in. And we have with us also Bishop Dante Hickman, my son. We have with us also uh, Reverend Robert Young, uh, Dr. Brad Braxton, and Reverend Dr. Boyer G. Freeman. So these gentlemen will take us right on to the stratosphere with you, Dr. Fauci. <laughs> Dr. Fauci, I uh, echo the sentiments of Bishop Walter Thomas and thank you for your very strong presence of peace, of clarity, and quite frankly, sanity during uh, some very chaotic uh, and confusing times during this pandemic. Uh, you spoke a little to this and I, I'd like uh, for you to hit it a little more. Uh, there are two events that are ingrained in the memories of many African Americans about the way we were treated by the healthcare uh, systems and health research uh, establishment. One was the outright neglect of, of um, healthcare for polio in the African American community. And of course, the second that you mentioned was the Tuskegee study. And when you look more locally, uh, we remember the Henrietta Lacks story and study. And we would like to know how can we be assured that the same thing is not happening with the COVID-19 vaccine research uh, that targets our community? Yeah. Well, again, it gets back, Reverend Hickman, to what I said, that, that I can't just tell you don't worry about it. What I can tell you is what I mentioned before. <clears throat> it is totally understandable of the reluctance that you speak of for, for those three reasons and yet even more. You're when you're dealing with COVID-19, the reason I sometimes get animated about it because I feel so strongly about it is that it is very, very painful 
to see that a community is suffering disproportionately from a disease in which there is help at hand. And what we're trying to do is to get them to understand that we want them to make use of those capabilities with regard to a vaccine. So we need your help. You know, we need the, and that's why I'm here today. I mean, I mean, I mean you think I'm helping you. I need your help <laughs> as much as, as, as you need our help. So that's the reason why we really got to partner together as literally as brothers and sisters to make sure that if there's anything that we need to do that you think we're not, I mean, we will, we will address that. Um, I mean, we think we know how to, you know, how to reach out and how to make sure that you get the facts and you get the, uh, the correct information. But there may be things, quite frankly, that we're not doing right. So we want to know, I mean, after this relatively short period of time that we're together, I don't like to end it like that. It needs to be a continued back and forth of communication about, you know, you're doing things you got to do a little better in this area. I mean, I, the, the idea that that I just uh, uh, heard about uh, the issue of access in the rural areas from Reverend Thomas, to me, that is something that is good to get that confirmed, that that's something that we're on the right track. We've really got to address that. We, we can't just, you know, take it as an abstract thing that's going to correct itself. It's not. It's not going to spontaneously be corrected. So hopefully we can work together and get beyond the concerns that you mentioned. Yeah, Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for your availability. We are all relieved that you look and sound relieved. And so um, thank you for being our hero in this, in this season. As one of the younger pastors, and I look up to so many here on the panel, um, my question is more so around, not so much scientific, but as far as strategic and su strategic support just reading through President Biden's national strategy for the COVID-19 response and pandemic preparedness plan, those seven goals. My question is, being that the black church we feel is the epicenter or, or the central location for our people, for information and empowerment, how can uh, churches, what can we do to further promote um, the, the vaccination? How can we get the information out? How can we partner with local hospitals, clinics, so that we become even a site to host, uh, a vaccination host for the community, especially those of us who have senior citizen homes and villages and things of that sort. Yeah, you know, uh, Reverend Young, just know this, that you are a very important part of that. I think it's 101 page of President Biden's thing. It has the seven major components. Just look at them, read them and see that how many of those really apply to things that you can do, where you can make your church, the setting of your church, a place where you can get information that is, is passed on to your parishioners because they have trust in you. And I think that's, again, one of the things that the president said, we need trust in the facts and trust in science. There's been so much miscommunication that has preceded what we're trying to do right now. Misinformation, you know, talk about things being a hoax and fake news and not real. People have great trust in their churches. And when the church takes the lead in getting the correct information to people, it's amazing how you can help turn around things. So I would think that where you are is, is not an outlier, but is a hub for where the information needs to be disseminated. So you can be an important part of the solution. Dr. Fauci, I'd like to thank you for seeing you again and your leveling presence uh, back on the national scene. And to hear you speak of the obligation of equity, I think, which is so important. It's been consistently documented and reported that Black and Latino people are becoming infected and dying at disproportionately high rates. 
why are race, ethnicity, and associated comorbidities not included as criteria in the vaccine rollout plan in many states? And would you be in favor of immediately adding those criteria? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. And it was a sensitive issue of saying, are you really going to be making um, priority on the basis of, of race? Or should you do it on the priority on the basis of comorbidities? And the decision was because of all the complications of when you're doing something on the basis of race, as a matter of fact, Reverend Freeman, I think that we can actually get the effect that you want, the effect that Dante Hickman just was talking about, about getting you know, people in, involved and have access to this right away. If you look at the numbers, the group that's the group that's right up there at getting the priority that's essentially next is people from 16 to 44 with underlying medical conditions. And I will guarantee you that there will be a disproportionately high percentage of brown and black people in that group. So I think you're gonna get covered in that group. And we wanna to move to that group as quickly as possible. Getting back to the plan mm -hmm. that was just mentioned by Reverend Young, the, the seven part plan, one of those is to move quickly into the expansion of the priority groups. That's exactly what the president was referring to. So he said it in a very interesting indirect way, but he was saying what you were saying, expanded quickly to get to the vulnerable groups. I think, I don't know which number of the seven that is, but that's one of them. Thank you. Right. Dr. Fauci, this is um, Karen Kotlop. I know how busy you are. We really um, are so pleased and grateful for the time that you've spent with us. We could ask you questions all day, um, but unfortunately I, I know you, that you must have um, other very important things to go to. So I wanna thank you from the bottom of our hearts for spending this time with us here today. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Kotler for having me and thank you all. It really is always a pleasure to, to, to meet with you. And, and I give you my solemn word that I will spend, you know, we're talking about disproportion. I will spend a disproportionate amount of my energy on pushing for the things that we've all spoken about today. And I wouldn't even say it's disproportionate. It's a negative when you say dis. <laughs> I, I think it's an appropriately proportionate amount of my energy spent on this. And I will continue to do that. So thank you all for having me. Dr. Fauci. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Would you say something about Kismikia Corbett? Sure. She's terrific. <laughs> Thank she you for helping my student out. This is Freeman Rabowski. <laughs> oh, Freeman, how are you? I didn't see that. Oh, hi, Tony. Doing? Thank you. Thank oh, you. Great. Great say something you. about that Black woman. It's important. No, we do. In fact, you know, she's been with me on a, on a bunch of things, has accompanied me together, because people do want to hear from her and see from her. You know, we sent her out to be there when Reverend Jackson got vaccinated yes. in Chicago. Yes, yes. You know, I, I told the Reverend to get her back quickly because she's got work to do. That's exactly right. Tony, I want people to hear that you have been supporting the development of black scientists for years. You've worked with my students from the MAU program and others, and I appreciate that. And people need to know that there are black people involved in the development of these vaccines over at NIH and around the country. Thank Indeed. you for that. All right, great, Freeman. Thanks a lot. Take, Take care. care. Bye-bye. Wow, wow. So Dr. Braxton, I have to apologize that you did not get an opportunity, but you will have many more opportunities coming up within the next 30 minutes. We're going to transition now to Dr. Stephen Thomas, who will take us into the segment that we get to really have some more conversation with uh, Dr. Grabowski, as well as James Jackson and myself. Please, uh, you may be the first one to take the lead in asking your question. Stephen, you're on mute. I mean, you need to come off of- You, you think I know that by now. Uh -huh. uh, so first of all, thank you very much. As you know, he started with Tuskegee in the aftermath, human subject protections were put in place and one of them is called justice. So the real lesson is making sure African-Americans actually get access to these trials. 
And so for um, Ms. Jackson and, and uh, Dr. Harboski, we applaud you because you signed up for a clinical trial. <laughs> and for the moment we have, for both of you, if we would just speak to what were the motivations that helped you get over the hump to join a clinical trial? And uh, Ms. Jackson, if you'll go first, and then uh, uh, Dr. Harboski, and I'll, I'll jump in because I know we're on time. What got you over the hump? Ms. Thank Jackson? You. Thank you. Thank you so much first for having me. I am honored and feel deeply privileged to be part of this conversation. Um, to get right to it, 400,000 plus people, lives that we've lost, including two from my own family, was the impetus to get me over the hump. Um, I, as corny as it sounds, wanted to be part of the change, you know, that I wanna see in the world. And I wanted to be a participant. I felt to echo uh, Dr. Fauci, um, I wanted to take on that responsibility. I wanted to um, be a part of something bigger where people that look like me can see that I was a participant, that statistics would echo um, and have real life data from people that look like me. Um, and then to echo what Dr. Reese said earlier, just to accept that challenge um, to be part of um, this vaccine trial so that it is representative and that I get, can go back and tell the community about participating in the trial and that not to take away any of the hesitancy. I understand that. I understand as um, the other eloquent speakers have spoken about how it's being steeped in history. Um, but that things are changing and that these vaccination trials are safe and they're thorough and they're thoughtful and that we as black and brown people are being disproportionately affected, that we should take on that responsibility. And I just feel honored and privileged to have that um, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Freeman, I hope I can call you Freeman. I'm standing sure. here at the barbershop. Talk to the guys in the barbershop. What got you over the hump? What was the... Sure. How do we get our brothers to sign up? Right. And I've talked about this in the Black Barbershop, in fact. Uh, my wife, Jackie, and I participated back in September. Uh, and we went through the September and October period for two injections. And we did it because I've been talking to my UMBC graduate, Dr. Kismikia Corbett, who has made history in the world as the first Black woman ever in the world to create a vaccine. She's one of the two lead scientists on that vaccine. Uh, and she's only 34 years old, but she had been telling me that they were having a really hard time convincing people of color, especially African-Americans, to be a part of this trial. I believe in her. I'd also worked with Tony Fauci and others before on some of these issues inv involving Black, getting more Black scientists into the work. And so we knew that this was the best advice we could get to work with these scientists. I should tell you that the Center for Vaccine Development at the University of Maryland School of Medicine is excellent. When we went in, not only were we welcome, but we saw people of all races helping with it. I mean, healthcare workers of all races, and they were supportive of us. Uh, we just went through last weekend the unblinding visit. That means when you go to see if you're part of the half who got what's called the placebo, when, which means you didn't get the real thing or whether you got the real deal, the vaccine. And we had felt and had been saying in interviews, we thought we got the real deal because we had, after the second injection, we had a sec, we had an amount of soreness in our arm and we felt really fatigued for a day or two. And I kept saying I felt a little loopy. My wife says I'm always loopy, but that the point is that when we get, went in last weekend, we found out we have gotten a real vaccine. So we were very pleased. It's the best thing we could have done. Uh, so much so that my wife took my mother-in-law, 96 year old, down to uh, the University of Maryland Medical Center. And there she got the vaccine this morning. She's a brave 96 year old taking that vaccine. We must take the vaccine. I love that each one teach one and being and the word of mouth is how it works in our communities. Uh, Dr. Kotloff, all over the newspapers, all are focused on get the vaccine. And yet we've heard today, we need more, which means we need more volunteers in clinical trials. Can you help us make that distinction of, of why our ministers need to also help recruit for the Nova, oh, Novavax or whatever the other trials are that are coming so that we have more vaccines? So I have to say, I'm not a sports person, but I love the analogy that 
you have to take multiple kicks at the goal to be able to score. And I think as Dr. Fauci mentioned that two vaccine companies leave us very vulnerable to be able to make enough vaccine for the world. That's, that's who we have to cover, two doses for most vaccines for the world. So we need more vaccine out there. And you can see you know, that um, we're having some trouble with the rollout and even being able to keep up with our conservative plans. And the other thing that Dr. Fauci pointed out is that the different vaccines have different platforms and, and require different handling. And so the ones that are under EUA need deep freeze. Um, we need other vaccines that don't require such a cold chain and can be sent out to more remote areas. Um, you know, some people get really worried about messenger RNA and the idea that could affect their genes. We can assure you that it won't, but there are vaccines that don't have mRNA. And so, you know, that can help people feel more comfortable. So I think they're just some of the reasons why we need to have a good six, seven, eight vaccines with different companies pushing vaccine out there once it's shown to be safe and effective as quickly as it can be manufactured. Well, Reverend Hickman, as I throw it back to you, the whole theme is faith, science, and trust. And you know, back in your days in HIV, uh, that wasn't always the case that the faith community had trust in science. How might this be different? And I'll turn it over to you to engage our, our clergy. So I think that it might be different in that it did not have sex uh, attached to it and sexuality, especially. And so there, those were a great many barriers that the church had to overcome and still is working on overcoming, understanding the nature that God created all of us. And so therefore, who are we to dispute with God how he made us and how we feel about various things in various places? But under the circumstance of COVID-19, we are all impacted and we are all on the same street and we are all crying out to the same God for saving. And so with that said, I am one of the human subjects that recently signed up for the Novavax for the very fact of, I love my children. I love my family. I love my friends as well. All of the people I come in contact with. I believe I was born to love on other people as other people have, have loved on me. With that said, I wanna call on Reverend Brad Braxton, uh, who has been in the fight these 30 years as well, and was one of the first pastors that opened their church to star when in the midst of the HIV epidemic. And now we are here to talk about something that's similar to HIV, we're talking about COVID. I wanna give you the floor, uh, Brad. Reverend Hickman, thank you. And thanks to all the colleagues and all who are sharing in this marvelous educational moment. And indeed, I appreciate you remembering how in fact we came together in the mid nineties at a time where there was so much stigma. And even in this moment, there continues to be stigma that we must deal with. So as I think about this conversation, particularly among educators, community and faith leaders and scientists, I think Dr. Fauci took us to a very important place when he talked about the social determinants of health. So I'm very curious to hear from panelists and all on this conversation, how do we better include spirituality as part of the social determinants of health? And by spirituality, I mean that very broadly, I'm not speaking just to the Christian community, but the deep ways that people make meaning, and if we can attach values and meaning making to then going to get the vaccine. In other words, we value our bodies, we value our children, we value our communities and our jobs, so much so that we are willing to go beyond any stigma and fear we have about the vaccine. So my question is, how does spirituality increasingly become, especially in the scientific community, a part of the social determinants mm -hmm. of health and wellness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a first. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rabowski. Yeah, let me say this as an educator and a Christian, uh, Dr. Braxton, excellent question. And what we're saying to our students of all religions and in general, um, we're taking this vaccine not just for ourselves, 
but for all the people around us. And when we think about the religions, when we think about Christianity and others, it is not just about what happens to us, it is about what happens to the people we are connected to. And it's the idea of giving to other people. When you take the vaccine, you're giving to your children and grandchildren and, and to grandparents and other people because you're making them safe. As long as you're not vaccinated, you have the potential to cause someone to get the vaccine, to get the, the disease and to die. And so from my perspective, people of faith want to keep others safe. And that means what we have to do for ourselves to help other people. And if I can just jump in, um, yeah, very great question. But also I think that we have a human responsibility just to the whole community at large. So um, spirituality also as a focus, but um, we are responsible to this type of um, illness that um, has such a devastating effect on those around us, those of any age. Um, and I feel that once we partake in these vaccine trials and actually get the vaccine, we're doing our part to really move our whole community forward, um, to get back to life as we knowing it, to get back to healthy interactions, to get back into um, business interactions and family interactions and really impact our mental um, wellness and our health wellness. So it's so much part of a bigger purpose. And in that you can't help but connect spirituality when you are really impacting a community at large. And, and Brad, I think that, uh, thank you for that deep question. I'm, I've always been astounded by your, your intellect and the way in which you articulate things. I, I think that in our spirituality and our faith-based institutions, that we have to expand our understanding of what it means to be healed and not look at healing as magic, but what are the different processes and ways we participate in that healing. And when I consider Jesus who healed in a myriad of ways and one way was particularly disgusting to me when he used his saliva uh, to heal. And that took a lot of trust on the part of the one that needed that healing. And in our communities, when we're talking about vaccinations, spirituality and healing, there's a severe distrust, not just because of the medicine, but the ways in which people are neglected and not cared for for decades in our community. And so there are a number of ways in which we have to restore that mindset, that trust. Um, <clears throat> people take the vaccine, it's good for you, but how do we holistically help people to heal? Yeah, and, and, to, and to piggyback off of Dr. Hickman, um, I was just thinking, because again, Professor Braxton, you have us all kind of stimulated, but I was thinking the church um, should really begin to embrace a, a, a broader the theology of wholeness. That's what I'm trying to say that um, when in third John it says, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prosper. So having this understanding that God wants us whole and then from, from that, uh, we go into the tributaries of wellness and all the different spectrums. So I think once we have an understanding that uh, our creator wants us to be whole, then we move into these realms of, of health and wellness that can benefit us individually and collectively with the communal responsibility. Yeah. Do we have to recreate the wheel or do the churches have health ministries already in place that we can build upon? Dr. Thomas, I, I don't think we have to recreate that wheel, uh, wheel. And to get to Dr. Braxton's question and what my colleagues are referencing about uh, health and wholeness, the, the World Health Organization defines health as the state of physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. But those of us who have been impacted and affected by the spirit of God, expand that definition to say that health is a state of physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, because much of what bothers us physically, mentally, and socially has its genesis in the spiritual man or woman. And when we reconcile ourselves with the spiritual man or woman and 
the spirit of God. Much of what bothers us physically, mentally, and socially reduces or is eradicated altogether. And so if we embrace the notions of health and wellness as a part of our spiritual practices within our houses of worship, then I think that there's a fluidity between uh, worship and wellness. And so this is just a natural extension, I think, of what we are called to do. And so I'm excited about being invited into this process and for this dialogue today. And I'm prayerful that we will continue this as we move towards uh, wholeness as uh, Reverend Young has just referenced. I am going to step in for just a moment to say that we do have a community of people that have been listening and watching and they have questions as well. And they and this question I'm about to ask is one that I believe ties in with what Brad, Dante, as well as you, um, Boyer, I hope you don't mind me being just a personal upfront. Uh, with Mama name is Boyer, thank you. Boyer, okay. The question is, what current techniques have shown success to inform and educate the African-American community? And what can faith leaders do to duplicate any successes at the grassroots level? And so in other words, what are we going to do post this conversation? Let's hope we keep talking. Bishop Thomas. Well, one of the things we've done to try to um, spur the conversation and at the same time bring in good information is we have what, call, what we call town halls. And we, um, we bring trusted voices in a setting very similar to this. And we work to bring all stages, ages of our congregation together and allow them to ask the questions, allow them to um, hear the comments. Because what we found is persons take ownership as they hear their question. And they also then take ownership of the answer. And so we found that to be extremely important for us. And so there's also another question, several questions, but I want to, before I go into a couple more questions from the audience, I want to ask Dr. Cutloff, what would you like to see us as the clergy, as the church, begin to do to help in this realm with uh, what you are working on currently? So I think that in this day and age, there are so many sources of information um, that it's very confusing for people to know what to believe um, and um, what kind of advice about vaccines and COVID and health um, they should listen to. And so what I would say um, part of your mission could be is to learn um, about the science of how vaccines are developed and work with, with um, your colleagues in medicine um, to try to develop your own message that you can share with your, your clergy. So you become a trusted information center. Reverend Hickman, there are 942 people with us right now. I'm wondering how, the, how this Zoom might help us bring scientists and this conversation into your congregations. Could this work? Yes. And so it, it would help us if we would bring the Dr. Cutloffs, the uh, Friedman Habrowskis, the Dean Reeses into this conversation. And Dean Reese has raised his hand. And so this conversation continues. Reverend Hickman, might I just speak to that particular issue? Um, I fundamentally think this is a real opportunity to bring communities of healers together. And I think sometimes faith leaders and scientists don't think of themselves as Dante has said in that broad way of healing. And so we get in our silo communities and each group has a way of talking that doesn't translate into the public. So for example, let me give you this one very brass tax example. Spirituality for me is not about dogma. It's not about a particular creed. It literally is from the Latin word spiritus, which means breath. So to be a spiritual person is to take moral ownership over the breath in my body. 
And if we began to redefine terms, so you don't have to subscribe to any particular religion doctrine to say, I'm going to be morally concerned about the breath in my body and the breath in your body. And if we learn to develop a public grammar and lexicon, then these communities could talk together and not past one another. Reverend Hickman. Just but I have to yield to uh, Dean Reese because he had his hand up and now we're into the conversation for sure. There's an amen and a, a glory hallelujah. <laughs> amen. Dean Reese, you must come off of mute. I mean, you must, uh, yeah. yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Just a brief comment. And I think I want to just pick up on something Dr. Kotlov says, and that is, how you could become your congregations can be informed and engaged. Let me make, make you a, a broad offer. Any one of you who would like to have someone, because as uh, Dr. Thomas says, we have Zoom, so it's a lot more efficient. Speak to your congregation as a, as a scientist, as a physician, we have enough that we can make them available. So simply send an email to Dr. Kotlov or to me, and we can make sure that we, we, at, we connect you with one of our scientists and assign them to basically be your guest for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour to speak to the, and, and take questions. So that becomes a way by which your congregation can be hearing from, from scientists who are, who are part of the whole vaccine program and could really speak to the, the issues very, very completely. So that's what I'd like to make an offer to you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hrabowski. Very quickly, just, just to help the audience, I'm looking at all the great questions. I assume Dr. Kotloff and Dean Reese that somebody will be answering their questions and that it will be posted so they can have them because there are so many great questions that are coming up. And then the, the, the point about getting a, a, an appointment for the vaccine. It is technology based. We need churches and universities working together to help people. Because as we've worked to get the vaccine for my, my mother-in-law today, you, if you don't know how to use the technology, you have a hard time getting through and getting that, getting that vaccine. We need people who can help people to fill out or do whatever is necessary because it's not just like calling somebody. You got to use the technology. And that makes it very inaccessible for a lot of people. So we need to think that through. And finally, there were people on this on the call who are asking about getting in, into the, the trials. And I want to be one of the ambassadors for the Center for Vaccine Development. We need to make sure we let them know how they can be in this next trial because we need more black people for this next trial. Yes, and I'm happy to be an ambassador with you as well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll remain an ambassador with you. And as we are drawing nigh on our time, I think that there are some things that we need to also share with everyone, that all of us in this room are committed to answering your questions. Those questions will be posted on the website. We will make certain that we follow up with Dr. Cutloff, with Dr. Thompson, Thomas and myself, and we will make sure that these illustrious uh, panelists that have been with us today, the influencers of our faith, that they will be in those rooms helping us to begin to mount a surmountable amount of programs that we can offer to all of our um, participants on this call and in each of our jurisdictions where we live as well as where we worship. This is not a one and done. This is just the beginning. And we want to say thank you to all of the clergy who have assembled here. They have assembled almost 32 questions that we needed to have answers to, and we just barely touched the surface. So stay tuned for what is coming up next. Dr. Cutloff, do you want to add to that before we say farewell for now? I just want to reiterate that I think this is the beginning of the conversation, and we are here in the Baltimore community to serve you and would love to be able to continue this type of conversation. So thank you so much for your, your time and participation. And on behalf of the University of Maryland College Park, we are the land grant. Our mission is to serve the state of Maryland. We are here for you as well from the School of Public Health and from our Center for Health Equity. Dr. Reese, do you have any final words or Dr. Robowski? Keep hope alive. 
keep hope alive. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to. I do want to affirm whatever uh, Dr. Kotloff and Dr. Rabowski and Dr. Thomas have said. I too want to just uh, again say how excited I've been to to host this on behalf of the School of Medicine. And again, the Center for Vaccine Development is one of our, our centers. Dr. Kotloff is one of her lead scientists. We're delighted to have her and to have her continue to lead. And again, most importantly, we're here for you and our scientists are available to you. All you have to do is make the ask and we'll do the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Reese. Thank you. And on behalf of Sisters Together and Reaching, our motto is, is that we are inspiring a revolution that nurtures the health and the social needs of our current and future generations. And we cannot do it apart from all the persons here and those of you that are watching. We thank you for being with us. Look for more in the coming days. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wear your mask, wash your hands, stay away from crowds. And keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. <laughs> <laughs>